third, and, and I'll round out the fourth, and we'll have our closing announcements at that time. If you're talking to someone about Jesus and trying to convert them, one of the things you can do, depending on if they believe in God or not, you can reason with them outside of the Scriptures, and then, of course, inside of the Scriptures, once you prove to them the Bible's the Word of God. You know, you might ask this question to get someone to start thinking. Why, do, why does someone who does not believe in God hold the door open at a restaurant for an elderly person? Why does a fornicator or a drunkard, maybe perhaps on a plane, and they drop something, you pick it up, and they say, thank you? Why do they do that? And the answer is because of the principles of Jesus that have been instilled in society, they subconsciously are following some of the Scriptures, even though they're not actually obeying the Scriptures. And so maybe you get them reasoning that way, then you get into proofs of God and proofs of the Bible. But I would say turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I want to read verses 6 through 9. 6 through 9. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 to 9. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And, of course, from this scripture, you could then go into a discussion, number one, that Jesus is Lord. It says it twice here, verse 7, the Lord Jesus. And then, of course, again, in verse number 8, the last sentence or phrase, our Lord Jesus Christ. You also could go into a discussion regarding the gospel. It says those that obey not the gospel, and that would lead you to other passages. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and following what the gospel is. It's the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The hope that is found in Jesus, that he's offered this salvation. Romans 2, 4 and following. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. But in this particular scripture, then, you can talk about how ignorance is no excuse. It says here he's coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Now, we know a man can know God. Matthew 7, 7 and following, ask and it shall be given unto you. Knock and the door shall be open. Or seek and, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be open. Ask, seek and knock. So God providentially will get the truth to someone if they're really looking. But from this scripture, I realize ignorance is no excuse. Secondly, I also understand that the gospel, while being the death, burial, and resurrection, involves something that a person must do, not to earn salvation, but to attain salvation based on God's terms, and it's called obey. Obey the gospel. In fact, that phrase is used about three times in the Bible. Obey the gospel, Romans 10. They've not all obeyed. Isaiah says they've not all obeyed the gospel. 1 Peter chapter 4 speaks of those uh, re regarding the fact they need to obey the gospel. If those who have obeyed the gospel, if it's harsh then, what about those who haven't? But here in this particular section of Scripture, you can discuss the Lord Jesus Christ. You can look at what the gospel is. You can look at the ignorance is no excuse. And then also you can, you can look at this that the gospel can be obeyed. Not, not only should it be obeyed, but it, 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 it can be obeyed. People are able to escape the justice that's coming by obeying the gospel. We all deserve to be lost because we've all sinned. Romans teaches that. We te teaches the wages of sin is death. We understand this. Sin separates us from God. The blood of Christ brings us back to God, but we access that blood in obedience to the gospel. But then I think I would end by making a, a very strong appeal to verse 9. Those who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You know, some try to act like hell is something that just lasts for a little while, annihilation. But yet that same Greek word and, and phraseology is used in Matthew 25, 46 of both heaven and hell. Talks about everlasting punishment, eternal life and everlasting punishment. What goes for one goes for the other. Well, here he's discussing this idea of everlasting destruction. So he says, yeah, but you're, you're causing people to be afraid. That's a hellfire and brimstone preaching. You know, Jesus did, did a lot of that. Twelve times Gehenna is used, and 11 of the 12, Jesus is the one who used them. And Jesus in Mount Mark chapter 9 talks about where the fire is not quenched, where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. Over and over, Jesus would refer to hell because he did not want people to go there. 
No one has to go to hell. Hell has been prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. And yet all those who live like the devil and don't obey the gospel and don't follow what the Lord Jesus Christ said, verse 6 says, it's a righteous thing with God to recompense those that trouble you. So I would simply say to a person, why would you want to be lost? You're going to die. Death is inevitable except the Lord come back first. And either way, you're going to be found in one of two positions if he comes back. Why would you want to face God with everlasting punishment when you could obey the gospel, be a member of the Lord's church, have the blood of Christ wash away your sins, live in a home the way God designed it, be a member of the church the way the Lord designed it, grow old the way the Lord designed it, and go to heaven because you didn't use ignorance as an excuse. You did obey the gospel. And so then we find, if you keep reading in verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe in that day, parenthetically, because our testimony among you was believed. And I want to say this as I end. In this same um, section of books, but in 1 Thessalonians, I don't know if this is allowed, but I'm going to do it and then I'm going to sit down. In 1 Thessalonians, I want you to notice chapter 2. It's probably not allowed, but, you know, I'm about to leave, I, you know. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, let me, it, this does go with it. 1 Thessalonians 2, look at this, what a beautiful verse. Remember he talked about those that obey not the gospel, they're going to be, they're going to be uh, consumed in flaming fire with the, the, the judgment day, away from the glory of the Lord. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1, 19 and 20. Paul says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Same context, basically. For you are our glory and joy. That tells me we're going to know each other in heaven. Paul says on the day of judgment, I'm going to look for those faithful Thessalonians. And I'm going to know that, that they have obeyed the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 1. They are our hope and joy and crown of rejoicing. Do you realize that one day we're going to see each other again and then be together forever? Isn't that a better alternative than 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 and following? How do you follow that? Good job. You know, I think about that question. I think about the idea that uh, it depends on where a person's at as to how you would answer that question. That is, where they're at spiritually. You know, what do they know about the Bible? And uh, when you go through the Book of Acts, the conversions in the Book of Acts, uh, they're they're found in speaking in different ways to different people about the matter of their salvation. For instance, when you come to Acts chapter 8, uh, Philip the eunuch, uh, you know, the eunuch is reading from Isaiah chapter 53, and uh, Philip joins him, and uh, he says, uh, do you understand what that read is? How can I accept some answer to guide me? And so he sat down and he taught him about the gospel of Christ, and, and in teaching him from Isaiah 53, he came to baptism. I've always thought, you know, I wish I had that whole conversation. We only have just what was recorded for us, but I wish I had that whole conversation. I'd like to know how you got from Isaiah 53 to baptism. But, uh, of course, it's through the suffering of Christ that he comes to that point that shows here's why Christ suffered, and uh, in order to be in Christ, here's what you need to do. Uh, but if, if I wanted to talk to somebody about Jesus Christ, I, I want to know who is he? And uh, what's that, what does that mean to me? And uh, uh, what's he done for me? And so I think I would go to John chapter 10 and talk about the good shepherd. And uh, if you go to John chapter 10, in verses 1 through 5, he gives a parable. And, uh, and then verse 6, it says, This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spoke unto them. And then said Jesus to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, you want to study about shepherds and, and, the, and the sheep and the sheepfold before you ever get into this. And, and make sure you have a good understanding of it because it is so parallel to the church. And, uh, and, and that's what he's talking about, isn't it? He, the church is in here, all right? Salvation is in here in this context. This way he says, I am the door of the sheep. He says, all that ever come before me are thieves and robbers, 
but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. He said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy, but I come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Christ says that in him you can have life and you can have it more abundantly. That is, your life can overflow. Who doesn't want that? I, I want a life that is overflowing, don't you? I want a life that is abundantly a life lived here on earth. Not just, I want life in eternity, but I want to know that in this life, I have a good life, and I can have it in Christ. And, and that's what Christ says, I came to give you life, eternal life, and here now, abundant life, that your life might overflow. And he says here that... Uh, he says, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And so it says, I, I give my life for the sheep. But he that is hard, he says, is not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, whose own the sheep are not. Seeth the wolf come in, leave the sheep, and fleeth, but the wolf catches them and scareth the sheep. The harling fleeth, because he is a harling, careth not for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and I am known of mine. And the Father knoweth me, even so as known as I the Father. And watch this, I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not this fold, speaking about the Gentiles, that I shall also must bring in, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now, the fold here is reference to the church. That is, there's only one church, only one fold, and there's only one shepherd, Right? There's not two shepherds, there's not two folds, therefore there's not two churches. But back up now and look at, back. go back with me to um, uh, verse 9. Christ says, I am the door. How many doors are there in the fold? Christ says, I'm the door. When you go back and study in, in ancient times and, and you look at the sheepfold, it, was, it would be a, a, a construction and uh, there would uh, be these uh, 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 three walls, and then in the front, they'd be walled in, but there'd be one door into that sheepfold. And, uh, and the shepherds, they would all uh, come in into the evening, and they'd bring their, 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 their flocks in, and there might be two or three shepherds out in the field bringing all the flocks into this one place. But when the next morning they went out, they would go out, and each individual shepherd would call his sheep with his own particular call, and his sheep would come to him. They wouldn't go to another shepherd. They'd go to that shepherd because they knew his voice. And they followed after him. Jesus says, I'm, I'm that shepherd. But he says here that, that I'm the door. That is, you've got to come through me, he says, all right? What did Christ say? I'm the way, the truth. No man cometh to the Father but except through me. Christ says, I'm the way. If you want to get to the Father which is to get to heaven, you got to come through me. He says, I am the door by me. He says, watch this. If any man enter in, watch this, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Well, how, how, do you, how, how are you saved? By coming through Christ into the one fold. And that brings you to baptism, doesn't it? See, how do you get into Christ? Well, Paul says, many of you have been baptized into Christ, have what? Put on Christ? There you are. If you're baptized into Christ, you put on Christ, therefore you come in through Christ into the one fold. I think this is a beautiful, beautiful passage about the church, the one church, about Christ, the one Savior, and about the salvation that Jesus Christ offers. And if we can get people to understand that, and I think that's one of the things we lack in our preaching it was, we might get people to talk about the idea that they need to be baptized, but, but then when they're baptized, you got to talk to them about the one church, and, and then they get totally confused because in the, in the world we live in, there are multiple churches out here all tell, telling them, man, hey, let's, we're, we're the church, we're the church, you know, come join us, you know. we got to convince people, show people, help people understand. Jesus says there's only one fold, and you come through him to get into one fold. That's the one church. Let me set a familiar stage for us all. We've had that Bible study. We've shown them water baptism is essential. And what do they say? 
why. You've already shown them the passages, but then oftentimes you'll hear the example of, my mama and daddy didn't do this. My grandma and grandpa didn't do this. Are you telling me that God is not going to let them be saved? You're telling me that after they've passed on that God is just going to allow them to no longer have a chance? Let me take you to John chapter 6 because it's so important to notice this because that happens in a study all the time. And in John chapter 6, beginning in verse 60, the Bible says that many of his disciples, they're currently walking with Christ. And they ask this question. They say, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? I love how Jesus responds because he always gets right to the heart of the matter. He doesn't say, oh, well, let me, let me change that real quick. Let me fix that. Let me clean that up a little bit. He just asks a simple question. Does this offend you? Are you upset about this? And he goes on to give some more truths in verses 61 all the way down to verse 65. And it says in verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples turned and walked with him no more. Now Jesus does have what seems to be a moment of discouragement when he says to the twelve, will you also go away? Peter responds and says, where are we going to go? You are the one that has the words of eternal life. We can't find that from anywhere else. You're the son of the living God. But I want you to think about that for just a moment, that oftentimes we find recorded throughout the New Testament this mentality. When people are called out on doing something that is sinful or they're given a truth that might be hard to understand. I'm reminded of Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16 where Paul says very plainly, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Are you going to all of a sudden treat me differently because I have the audacity to call you out on doing something that is wrong? Or perhaps you might remember in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 16, where Jesus was not the enemy at question there, and yet people sought to kill him because of what he had been doing. They made him an enemy in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. But I'm reminded mostly when it, thinking about John 5 of what he said in John 15, 18 and 19. The world should not like us. It can't like us. If you have a friendship with the world, you have a problem. And when I talk to somebody about studying the Bible and I find that question come up, which says basically, won't God make an exception for me and my family? What they're really saying is, can't we be friends with the world instead of truly following after Jesus and his teaching? And in John 6, many of the disciples, they turned and walked with him no more because that's what they wanted to do. They didn't want to follow him anymore. Once the teaching became too real, too hard for them to really grasp and say, we're willing to follow you to the end, they decided, hey, we'll just take our ball and go home. We don't have to play anymore. That's not how this works. Jesus, on one occasion, thinking about this same mentality, would say in Luke 14, 26, a man who does not hate father, mother, son, daughter, wife, family, relative, friend, whoever and wherever, is not worthy of me. It's a hard question to be asked by somebody. You mean to tell me that my mama and daddy are not saved? You mean to tell me that my grandfather, who was one of the best people in the community, the best people that you would have ever met and known, you mean to tell me he's not saved? Does this offend you? Because it's not me that's saying it. It's Jesus. Jesus has clearly set terms on what we must do, how we must behave. And I think we need to change a phrase that we've said in the church... People often say, I love the Bible, but I don't think we really grasp what we are trying to say when we say that. I've started to say, I don't like everything that I read in here. How can I? People are going to be lost. I don't like that people can't live life in a way that they're living because it means that they're going to be lost. But because I love the God who wrote it, it must require me to obey what I read that I don't like. Because that's what true obedience is. 
And when somebody is sitting across the table from me and they're asking that question, you mean to tell me my family's not saved? My answer has to be, what would Jesus tell you? Would Jesus tell you that there's an exception for them that is not found for anyone else? Would Jesus tell you that, well, just this once will we'll change it? Or would Jesus say, will you follow me? This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Ultimately, what they were asking, it seems, by the way the text continues is, this is a hard saying. Why should we want to follow it? Why should we want to do it? I can tell you why. Because you love the Lord. Because loving God means doing things that He has commanded of me, whether I like them or not. I tell my son all the time, you don't have to like it, you don't have to love it, but you better respect it. Mama and Daddy have authority, and when they tell you to do something, you better listen. Same with any adult. If an adult tells him to do something, we reinforce You better listen. I want him to grow up and one day say, because he said to do it, I better listen. Meet me in 1 John, 1 John 1. Got something with me here. May not mean anything to you, but my friend Sarah, she ran up to me a few minutes ago and she said, Hey, you want something awesome? Well, yeah, I do. And she reached down in her little bag and she said, Here you go. And I got to looking at that package and, you know, I've opened, I bet you I've opened thousands of these for my children, by the way. Self, kind of selfish moment. My youngest turned four today. I'm so proud of him. He's such a good boy. But I, I noticed something I had never noticed on this package. These fruit snacks are not intended to replace fresh fruit in the diet. All right, hang on. Real fruit. Fake fruit. Real fruit. Fake fruit. Which one is it? That kind of got me tickled today. And, and, and what I want us to do, if I had to answer the question, if I could pick one passage, I would pick 1 John 1, and I would look at verses 6 through 10. And just read them with me, then I want to show you three words, and that's why I would pick this passage. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I want you to think about three words. The first word is if. The second word is all. And the third word is confess. I want you to look at the words if, and I want you to look in verse 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Notice this, verse 6, if, first word. Verse 7, but if we. Verse 8, if. Verse 9, if. Verse 10, if. Here's what I would tell you if I was picking one passage God wants you to choose. But he's not going to force you. And you and I can look through the pages of time, whether we look at it through a historical lens in the history books of men, or we look through it in an historical lens in the history book of God and his people, here's what we learn. God has never forced man to do anything. If. I love that. Verse 6. If we say. By the way, if you're a Christian, that's a big phrase, isn't it? If we say we have fellowship with him and we don't do it, what, what, what are we? We're, we're liars and we don't do the truth. But if we walk, here's the positive. The, ver, the verse 6 was the negative. If we say we are but we don't. Verse 7, if we walk, that's the Christian lie. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, if we're the false way again. Verse 9, it's positive again. If we confess our sins. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned. The word if, very powerful word right here. 
Because God has not made you do anything, but doesn't he call you to do something? Did he not come and do something for you and for me? The word if is very big in my opinion here. Then I want you to see our second word. It's inside of verse 7. It's the word all. Let's just read verse 7 and, and look for the word all as it comes into play. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. Here's number two. God has not required anything or not, not going to require you to do something. He's not going to force you. But number two, God has done something for you. We see the blood of Christ here. What is the power of the blood of Christ? Well, we could go to Acts 20, 28. We can think about how it purchased the church. But I want you to see it here in 1 John 1, 7. What does the blood of Christ do? It cleanses us from all sin. What has God done for you? What has Christ done for you? He has made it possible for you. He's made it possible for me to be redeemed, to be justified, to be sanctified, to be saved. I think that's really important for us to see as we think about this idea and we think about this context. Here, here's the next word. I want you to see something because it, it connects us to the word all. It connects us to verse 7. It's the word confess. It's in verse 9. Read it with me. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word all again, but I want you to see something. God is not going to do for you what you can do for yourself. There is no doubt that the blood of Jonathan Burns and the blood of you could not redeem mankind. There is no doubt that if we could take up a collection of all our monies, we could not buy the redemption of one soul as silver and gold or vain conversations received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. But I want you to see something here. You and I play a part in this all. You and I play a part in this if. You and I play a part in it. It's in verse 9. If we confess, now listen to this. This is where we don't like it. But this is where it meets you and it meets me. If we confess our Sins. I want you to see something else in this passage. It's in verse 9. If we confess our sins, notice that is plural. Now, how many people in this room right now wants to admit that they have sins or that they have sinned in the past? We don't like the word sin because the word sin means we sent Jesus to the cross, doesn't it? Why did he go to the cross? Well, he had to shed his blood. Why did he shed his blood? Look back to the verse we already looked at. For the remission of how many sins? All sins. And here's the word confess. God does not do for man what man can do. And God requires all men everywhere to repent. That's connected to that word confess here. This is the concept of changing. And he tells us something about this. If we're willing to confess, if we're willing to change, what is he willing to do? He's willing to forgive. Now this is where I would ask this question. And what sin is God not willing to forgive? If all confess. But there's a, another thing happening here. It happens three different times. It's verse 6, it's verse 8, it's verse 10. If we say, a majority of this passage is written to Christians... And that's us, isn't it? If we say, verse 6, we have fellowship with him. If we say we have no sin, verse 8. If, if we say we've not sinned, now listen. If we just stopped at those first commas, pretty neat passages. But there's so much more to those. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and, and walk in darkness, if we sin, if we don't change out of those sins, if we're not willing to confess those sins and get out of those sins, we lie and do not the truth. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. I, I don't think we'd lie to ourselves, would we? But we can. Verse 10, if we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar. And listen to this, here's the key of it. And his word is not in us. That might be the context of the passage. His word is not in us. Do you know what we must do to be saved? Do you know what we must do to obey God? Do you know what we must do to understand heaven? There it is. 
His word must be in us. So I would use 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 10 with if, all, and confess. And I would tell them that that's where it's real. In life, there are so many fake things. There are so many things that read, these fruit snacks are not intended to replace fresh fruit in the diet. Even though on the front, what does it say? Made with real fruit. Jesus Christ is the real that we should follow. There are so many counterfeits in our world, and Jesus is the one we should follow. I appreciate uh, our guys speaking in this session. I kind of, uh, I, I did something on purpose. I, I waited as late as I could to email them and say, here's what I want you to do, because I, I didn't want them to think about it very long. I wanted them to know that passage, and, and they picked all those passages. Now, every one of them yesterday said, what if someone picks my passage? I said, I don't know. But they did well. I appreciate them. Thank you so much, men, for doing that. A couple of announcements uh, to get us into this session. I uh, want to keep something, and we're going to have a special prayer before we close this session for this. I, I do want you uh, to be thinking.